acceptable. So first, our objectives, this will be the, to describe what is pressure and temperature. Second one is to discuss pressure and temperature level measuring instruments. And lastly is to show how the instruments work. So pressure, um, the, our first topic will be pressure measuring instruments. So first let me discuss what is pressure. So pressure is the force acting per unit on an object. Short is pressure. Though it is directly proportional to force, they are not the same thing since pressure depends on the area wherein force is applied. Second one is meaning. The larger the area, the less pressure it becomes. Shortly, it is inversely proportional. Next. So the formula in pressure since strong gamit na gamit natin before. P is equal to F over A, wherein P is equal to pressure, F is equal to force, and A is the area of an object. So the standard unit we use in pressure is the Pascal or Newton per meter squared in SA units and pounds per square inch PSI in English unit. Alam po natin na gamit na gamit natin ito, especially last time, kung saan gamit na gamit natin sa fluid mic. So we assume that everyone is familiar with this unit. So pressure can also be observed on our daily life. So this will be the application of pressure. Some are the air pressure in car tires, sipping drinks through straw, flying an aircraft, and etc. But obtaining pressure on the given examples cannot be obtained without proper measurement. Distinguishing zero references can achieve through the following different types of pressure. That was stated by Bay by J. Use um, site. So first is the atmospheric pressure. This is one of the type of pressure we're in. It is the pressure at the bottom of this sea of air in which we live in. Simply the pressure of the Earth's atmosphere. Yet it varies with weather changes with elevation. Meaning sa pagtaas po natin na lugar, especially mountain, sa babago yung ating pressure. So normal atmospheric pressure at sea level is 1 atmosphere or ATM. It is the standard unit for pressure. So this is the conversion conversions of the 1 ATM wherein is atmospheric pressure will be equal to 101.325 Pascal or 101.325 kilopascal, 1.013 bar, 1.013 times 10 raised to 6 line per square centimeter, 14.7 PSI, 29.92 inch HG, 760 mm HG, and 1 atmospheric pressure will be also equal to 760 torr. Gamit na gamit natin to. So, I think kailangan natin to ma-familiarize when it comes to pressure measuring instruments, especially the conversion factor. The next type of pressure will be the gauge pressure or, and also it is known as the relative pressure wherein it is related to the atmospheric pressure. Gauge pressure can be positive when pressure is above atmospheric pressure and it is negative when pressure is below atmospheric pressure. But negative gauge pressure is vacuum where it is equivalent to negative 101.325 Pascal in a per perfect vacuum. The next type is the absolute pressure, wherein it is the sum of the gauge pressure and atmospheric pressure. In short, absolute pressure will be equal to gauge pressure plus atmospheric pressure. Then the next one is the differential type of pressure, wherein it is another type of gauge pressure. This type of pressure helps in measuring the difference between two different pressures. Differential pressure commonly applies in flow and level measurement pressure. Meaning ito yung ano, kung bagay sa ari, yung nasa equation is delta P is equal to P1 minus P2. Any point in, in a, any pressure na isisolve natin, meaning that is the differential pressure. Just like what the meaning says, the difference between the two different pressures. 
Then the last one will be the vacuum pressure type of pressure. It is also known as the negative gauge pressure. Gaya nung nakanote natin kanina sa gauge pressure, negative gauge pressure will be equal to 101.3 to 5 Pascal in a perfect vacuum. Vacuum pressure is a pressure that is lower than the atmospheric pressure. Hence, measuring pressure will be the difference between such pressure, P, and the atmospheric, atmospheric pressure, or PATM. Now, equating it, vacuum pressure is equal to P, certain pressure, minus atmospheric pressure. So it is also noted here that atmospheric pressure, pressure should be greater than the unknown pressure. So here's the diagram wherein we can see how the pres vacuum pressure it is. So ito po yung ating diagram. Um, the bottom one will be the absolute pressure. The medium one is the atmospheric pressure. And the top one will be the some points na nakasertain para ma-measure natin yung ano, absolute pressure. So let's give it a sample now. Absolute pressure will be the top and the bottom lines, yung mahaba, then the mid. Yung shorter one is the atmospheric pressure. Yung nakanote kanina, positive pressure above the atmospheric pressure will be the gauge pressure and we also stated that negative atmospheric pressure or the pressure below the atmospheric pressure will be the vacuum pressure. So ito yung nakalagay dito, nakastate naman yung mga unit, absolute pressure or the P-abs is the measured relative to perfect vacuum, atmospheric pressure or P-ATM, the weight of the atmosphere on a given point, the gauge pressure measured relative to P-ATM and the absolute pressure Theoretical perfect vacuum mode. That was redundant. So next po. So here is an example po ng ating ano, problem with regards to pressure. Given yung nabanggit natin kanina, when it comes to absolute pressure, that it is the sum. So let's have an example for this type of pressure. If a pressure gauge reads 50 PSI, and the atmospheric pressure is 14.7 PSI, find the absolute pressure. So this will be an easier one since the formula was given earlier. In order to solve this, so absolute pressure is equal to gauge pressure plus atmospheric pressure, where in the gauge pressure we can measure, it is stated naman na if our pressure gauge reaches 50 PSI, so we can simply identify it as the gauge pressure and the 14.7 is stated naman yung atmospheric pressure. The formula for absolute pressure is the sum of the two pressure, the gauge and the atmospheric. So meaning 50 plus 14.7 will be equal to 64.7 PSI. Ganun lang po kadali since this is the review naman sa ating pressure. So next one po will be the instruments used in measuring pressures. Good morning po. Now let's start discussing one of our group's main topic po which is yung pressure measuring instrument niya po. Ang first po in our instrument is barometer. Ito po makikita po natin sa picture kung ano yung itsura ng barometer. Next po. Barometer is a device used for measuring atmospheric pressure. The figure shows a mercury barometer that consists of mercury container that is open to the atmosphere and an inverted tube also filled with mercury. Barometer acts as a scale and it was invented by Torricelli, representing the unit of tor, wherein one tor is equals to one millimeter of mercury. Since Earth's atmosphere is filled with air, atmospheric pressure can be measured by pushing the liquid mercury in the container. It will rise if the pressure is high and sink when the pressure is low. Note po that mercury is ideally suited for this due to its high density and its very low vapor, vapor pressure. To further discuss po yung barometer and how it works po, let's watch a video po.
stand on a graduated school. Students, diameter is used to measure the atmospheric pressure. Let us study the construction of a diameter. First, take a capillary tube of about 100 centimeter. Its one end is closed and the other end is open. A funnel is fitted in the open mouth and very dry and pure mercury is filled in it. After filling mercury in the capillary tube, it is put in an inverted position in a trough containing mercury. The open end of the tube is closed with a thumb and the end is dipped in the mercury trough. Students, the thumb is removed very carefully so that no air passes in the capillary tube. The tube is supported with the help of stand and a graduated scale is put parallel to it. After some time, the level of mercury begins to fall and becomes stationary. The height of the mercury coin is measured from the surface of mercury in the trough. Students, this height is 760 mm or 76 cm. Therefore, it is also called 760 mm mercury. That is 760 mm height of mercury coin at sea level. As the mercury falls, it leaves a blank space above it. This space is called Torricellian vacuum. Since it was identified by Torricelli, as the altitude increases, air pressure decreases. As the air pressure decreases, the mercury column in the capillary tube begins to fall. Thus, mercury barometer is also used in finding the altitude or height of a mountain. In aeroplanes, barometers without mercury are used to measure the altitude gained by the plane. Students, so, so, yun po yung barometer po. Meron po siyang container na open sa atmosphere and a tube filled with mercury. Then, babalik rin po yung tube na nasa, dapat po nasa loob na po siya nung isa pang container para pag binaliktad po, para ma-measure po yung atmospheric pressure. Ayun po, sana po mas naliwanagan tayo or nag-idea kung paano gamitin ang barometer to measure pressure. Ang next po na instrument is piezometer. Next po. Piezometer is a head measuring or level indicator for liquid fluid inside a large reservoir. It is vertically installed beside the large reservoir to indicate the level of fluid inside it. It is yung, yung pressure. Then the pressure is indicated by the height of the liquid in the tube as seen in the figure on the right. Measuring the pressure corresponds with the gauge pressure that atmospheric pressure is added to the gauge pressure, yet it is often used in monitoring the pressure in boreholes or depth of underground. So, may video po ulit na mapapanood natin para mas maintindihan yung piezometer. Alright, welcome to Site 5. This is our piezometer. The piezometer is a tube or a pipe that's been bored down into the ground so that it goes into the water table. That's something you can look at uh, online to see how the piezometer is all at right the top. Inside is the pipe. I'm going to put down our little collection tube. Now we're going to release this down, feed out until I hear and feel it touch the water. There, I've touched the water. I'll let it fill up. I'm going to grab the top because I want to measure how deep down the water table is. Watch me here. A little bit of an old man track. Down to the bottom. Grab the top. I have now just taken away the height of the pipe. Measure it out. One metre. Two metres. Roughly. And 92 centimetres, I'd say. Two metres, 92. I'm going to put our water into here so the water table is two meters 92 centimeters down below turn on my electrical conductivity meter place it in and our reading once again over 2000 microsecs per centimeter i'm gonna to have to come back down here with a more sensitive piece of equipment because i've got a feeling that could be as high as 10,000 units while we're here let's have a look at a sample prepared earlier this is our soil salinity. Turn on. I'm going to place this in. And the salt reading in the soil here. 500. 502, we'll call it. So we've gone 
piezometer, depth of water table, salt reading of the water, salt in the soil. Don't forget if you like my channel to click on the button at the top to subscribe, like down the bottom and leave really nice comments for me because I've just walked two kilometres with all that gear to get here while you're sitting at home surfing the internet. So yun po yung piezometer. Yun po, siya po isang open tube na simple manometer din po siya na yung isang end ay connected sa pipe or tank na i-measure at yung isang end naman po ay open sa atmosphere. It is used po to measure underground water pressure. Yun lang po. So the next instrument is the open tube manometer. And next slide po. Audible po ba? Hindi, hindi siya audible. Okay. Audible na po? Yes po. About the others, audible na sa inyo? Yes po. Oh. Yes po. So, the next instrument that we will discuss about is the YouTube manometer. So, next slide po. Um, the YouTube manometer, it consists of a glass tube in a huge shape that is connected to the gauge point and the other end was open in the atmosphere. The pressure can be measured by the liquid's specific gravity that is greater than the fluid in the reservoir. To be simplified, the difference in liquid height represents the pressure applied. So next slide pa for the video. In this video, we're going to use this YouTube manometer to try and measure the gas pressure of gas in lab five. So what do we need to do? Well, it's a very simple device. Here we have got a glass shaped YouTube, not a video hosted inside, but it's glass shaped in a U shape. And it's filled with liquid, which has got a bit of water, which has got some food colouring in so we can see what's going on. And at the moment, the pressure is the same on both sides, which is tremendous. So we can definitely see pressure, this hose goes just off the top of the screen and into there. The pressure is the same at both ends. Now I'm going to connect to the gas tap, turn on the gas tap, and now we can see that the level has increased on this side because inside here, gas from the gas tap has entered here and increased the pressure on this side. And what I'm going to try and do is roughly measure the height difference between the two sides for you. Uh, I'm not going to go for super accuracy, but let's pop this meter ruler in there. And uh, it looks to me that you crop, you can do with a non ruler, that it's maybe 24 centimetres difference between the two parts. So, as you can see in the video presentation, the instance that the other column in the left column, um, a pressure is is put, the liquid in the other column is rise, begin to rise. And we can measure the pressure here by using a ruler to measure the height. So can you back, can you go back to the recent slide, please? To further explain, as the name suggests, a YouTube manometer is U-shaped and the other column is open to the atmosphere. We measure the pressure applied by utilizing the height component that we can able to measure. Also, a specific gravity is mentioned. We can use the specific gravity to identify the density of the liquid. Um, going back to our study, um, the ratio of the specific gravity is the density of the substance over the density of the standard, uh, which is the water. So revising the equation, we can just multiply the specific gravity to the 
the density of the standard, which is the water, to get the density of the substance. And then after identifying the, the height and the density, we can now proceed to getting the applied force. So let's say the pressure at the column in the A is an oil and the liquid, which is the color yellow, is mercury, which is usually the, the used usually. So the formula goes like this. The pressure A plus pressure of the oil will be equals to the pressure of the mercury. So revising that equation, we can get that the pressure A is equals to the pressure of the mercury minus the pressure of the oil. So we also know that pressure has a formula that it's the density times the gravity times the height. So um, adding that to the equation, pressure A will be equal to the density of the mercury plus the gravity times the gravity times the height of the the mercury minus the density of the oil times the gravity times the height of oil. So take note that the height measured here is from the is from a certain reference line. And the reference line here is you can see in the number two and number three. That's where the reference line and that's where we measure the height. So going back to the equation, we can now get the pressure of the A. And if you're wondering why I did not include the pressure atmosphere here, even though it is open to the atmosphere, it's not because pressure atmosphere is zero. But in this case, I ought to get the pressure gauge. Well, the pressure gauge is the pressure above the atmosphere. So it will be depending, of course, in the what is required. Either way, pressure atmosphere is just pressure gauge plus the pressure of the atmosphere. Pressure absolute, rather, is equals to pressure gauge plus the pressure atmosphere. So next slide. Next slide, Papa. So now we can go to discussing gauge. Next slide, Papa. A mechanical gauge, a pressure measuring device which deflects under the action of the applied pressure. It operates and indicates the pressure by a pointer that is moving against a graduated circumferential scale. It used for measure high pressures and for those who does not require high precision. Some of the type of mechanical gauges are burden tube pressure gauge diaphragm pressure gauge, and etc. So actually, po, a mechanical gauge is generally used to measure various specific physical quantities, such as pressure, temperature, force, or displacement. Um, so it's not the mechanical gauge, it's not exclusive to pressure only. But in this, in this discussion, we are focusing on the mechanical gauge which is used to compute the pressure. So through mechanical means without the use of electronics or digital components. Um, it relies on the principle that the change in the physical quantity being measured can be translated into a visible or tangible mechanical movement, which then can be read and interpreted by an operator. So hindi po siya pinapagana ng electricity kaya magiging maganda siya sa mga harsh environments dahil magiging durable siya and simple and reliable. However, they may have limitations in terms of the precision and remote monitoring. Unlike the manometers where we are we add extra computations. But in this mechanical gauge, the value is being direct directed into the instrument so there may be a um 
not precise variables or computations. Next slide. Yeah. Next naman po is yung some types of mechanical gauge. Una po is burden gauge. Next slide. Burden tube pressure gauge, this is the most common type of mechanical pressure gauge. It uses a curved tube that straightens when pressure is being read on a dial. It is used for its high accuracy and precision. The ability to resist to vibration and its less maintenance cost. Burden gauges are suitable for either liquid or gas and for low and high pressure application. Commonly, it can measure up to 7,000 or approximately 10,000 TSI. Next slide. So, dito po makikita natin yung burden pressure gauge na kapag po nag na pressure siya ng air or liquid, nag-straighten out po siya para pong balloons na nilagyan ng hangin. So, yun. Next slide. Para po sa... Yan po. Ito po yung video kung how it works. Hey everyone, my name is Dr. Lee Kingwood and this is my assistant engineer, James Luffy. To begin, allow me to go through the apparatus view. This is the model of the pressure gauge. This is the distance and this is the date wave. These are some of the parameters and uh, numbers you would want to know. This is the piston area, short here, the plunge and platform weight. Calibration constant, which is in a uh, different unit. The experiment we did by putting the piston in the lane. When you put in, you want to ensure the bubble is clear in this way. Then you count the reading. It's the first reading. After that, So yun po, makikita po natin sa video na yung movement is operates a mechanism which drives a pointer around the graduated dial. So the movement of the pointer is proportional to the applied pressure. Next slide po. Next, mechanical gauge po, yung types ni diaphragm pressure gauge. Next slide. So diaphragm pressure gauge, this device has the same principle as burden gauge, but a diaphragm is provided instead of or a burden tube. It is made from sheet metals with precise dimension, which can be either flat or corrugated. Moreover, the diaphragm is mechanically connected to the transmission mechanism that will amplify the small deflection, which will make the point moves. So, next slide. Uh, leave that. So, ito po. Makikita natin this diaphragm pressure gauge na meron po siyang flange po. Tapos po sa flange dun po nagpapunction yung diaphragm. Next, para dun sa, ay, 
the diaphragm isolated the uh, internal components from media making this device suitable for contaminated liquid and gases. It's also suitable for measuring low pressure pressures such as atmospheric pressure and for monitoring the pressure of a gas canisters. Next. So yung video nung sa diet. Diaphragm seals are used in different areas of pressure measurement. For the following applications, diaphragm seals are indispensable when it must be prevented that a critical medium has a direct impact on the measuring instrument, or when the measuring point is in an unfavorable position so that the measuring instrument cannot be installed or cannot be read. In both cases, completely different measuring conditions could also prevail. Hence, diaphragm seals must be flexibly adapted and customized to their respective intended purpose. The function is always identical in both cases. Diaphragm seals separate the medium from the measuring instrument. With the aid of a fill fluid inside the diaphragm seal, the pressure is now transmitted to the measuring instrument. The individual components are perfectly attuned to their respective application and thus ensure a reliable measurement. Diaphragm seals are extremely flexible. They can be mounted to any type of pressure measuring instrument. They allow the measured value to be read directly at the measuring point or from a distance so that measurement is, for example, also possible at extreme medium temperatures. Diaphragm seals can be manufactured from a wide range of materials, such as haskaloy, tantalum, and coated with special materials like PFA or gold. They therefore enable measurement also with aggressive, abrasive, and all other critical media. No matter how special the application may be, our Vika experts will be glad to advise you. So yun po, the pressure measured is applied to the underside of the diaphragm. Then the two flanges hold the diaphragm around its circumference. Then so the diaphragm is the greater the pressure and the greater the movement. So yun lang po. Alright, so uh, bago tayo mag-proceed sa temperature level measuring instruments na, so that's a part 2 ng inyong report for today. So, balik lang ako dun sa pinaka-first part ng inyong um, discussion. Pakibalik na po ako sa slides. Okay na, okay. Na. So, itong first part na to before we proceed sa pressure measuring instruments, um, I have a video um, prepared para po isummarize na, yung um, all about pressure muna. Na. So, I'll be sharing my screen. So, um, I'll be sharing my screen po. Then, this is the summary of the pressure. Na. In this video, we are going to see about pressure basics and types of pressure. What is pressure?
In this video, we are going to be about pressure basics and types of pressure. What is pressure? Pressure is the physical force exerted on an object. In this video, we are going to see about pressure basics and types of pressure. What is pressure? Pressure is the physical force exerted on an object. Consider an object on which a force is acting perpendicular to the surface. Pressure is the force applied perpendicular to the surface of an object per unit area. Alright, so visible na ba si screen, guys? Yes, po. Alright, so how about the audio? Nag-work naman yung audio kanina? Yes, po. So let us watch this video. Na. So this is the summary of uh, pressure. In this video, we are going to see about pressure basics and types of pressure. What is pressure? Pressure is the physical force exerted on an object. Consider an object on which a force is acting perpendicular to the surface. Pressure is the force applied perpendicular to the surface of an object per unit area. Area is A, force is F, and pressure is P. Pressure is equal to force divided by area. Types of pressure. There are different types of pressure. We will see five important types of pressure here. Atmospheric pressure at sea level. Gauge pressure is the pressure above atmosphere. Vacuum pressure is the pressure below atmosphere. Absolute zero, where there is no pressure exist. Absolute pressure is the pressure above absolute zero. Differential pressure is the difference in pressure between two given points. Atmospheric pressure is also called as barometric pressure. Atmospheric pressure is defined as the force per unit area exerted against a surface by the weight of the air above that surface. Pressure at sea level is approximately 1 atm. Pressure has many units. Here is the equivalent pressure in different units.
gauge pressure is the pressure relative to atmosphere. Gauge pressure is used to measure the pressure difference between a system and the surrounding atmosphere. That's why the reading of pressure gauge is showing zero at atmosphere. Sometimes, the pressure unit is added with G, at the end, to indicate gauge pressure. However, without G, it is understood as gauge pressure. Pressure below the atmospheric pressure, is called as vacuum pressure. Vacuum pressure, is also known as, negative gauge pressure. Vacuum pressure, is usually indicated with negative sign. Perfect vacuum is never possible in practice. It is not observed anywhere in the universe. Even the space will have a very low pressure, which means, not completely vacuum. Pressure above absolute zero is called as, absolute pressure. You can notice, the word absolute, is present in the dial of pressure gauge. Absolute pressure is equal to atmospheric pressure plus gauge pressure. Absolute pressure, is always indicated with A, at the end of, pressure unit. Differential pressure, is the difference in pressure, between two points. Differential pressure, is equal to, pressure at point 1, minus, pressure at point 2. Differential pressure gauge, will be connected with high pressure side at one end, and low pressure side at another end. The difference between, high pressure side, and, low pressure side, will be indicated in gauge. Thank you for watching this video. For more videos like this, please. Alright. And here's another video naman po para naman sa concepts ng uh, manometer, uh, ng barometer na ito, you know? So. Aristotle famously said, nature fears of empty space, when he claimed that a true vacuum, a space devoid of matter, could not exist, because the surrounding matter would immediately fill it. Fortunately, he turned out to be wrong.
Alright, so again, this is the history na, and concept of the um, barometer. Now, so let us watch this. Really bad, guys. Aristotle famously said, Yes, Bob. Fears of empty space. But he claims that a true vacuum, a space devoid of matter, could not exist because the surrounding matter would immediately fill it. Fortunately, he turned out to be wrong. A vacuum is a key component of the barometer, an instrument for measuring air pressure. And because air pressure correlates to temperature, and rapid shifts in it can contribute to hurricanes, tornadoes, and other extreme weather events, a barometer is one of the most essential tools for weather forecasters and scientists alike. How does a barometer work, and how was it invented? Well, it took a while. Because the theory of Aristotle and other ancient philosophers regarding the impossibility of a vacuum seemed to hold true in everyday life, few seriously thought to question it for nearly 2,000 years, until necessity raised the issue. In the early 17th century, Italian miners faced a serious problem when they found that their pumps could not raise water more than 10.3 meters high. Some scientists of the time, including one Galileo Galilei, proposed that sucking air out of the pipe was what made water rise to replace the void, but that its force was limited and could lift no more than 10.3 meters of water. However, the idea of a vacuum existing at all was still considered controversial, and the excitement over Galileo's unorthodox theory led Gasparo Berti to conduct a simple but brilliant experiment to demonstrate that it was possible. A long tube was filled with water and placed standing in a shallow pool with both ends plugged. The bottom end of the tube was then opened and water poured out into the basin until the level of the water remaining in the tube was 10.3 meters. With a gap remaining at the top and no air having entered the tube, Berti had succeeded in directly creating a stable vacuum. But even though the possibility of a vacuum had been demonstrated, not everyone was satisfied with Galileo's idea that this empty void was exerting some mysterious yet finite force on the water. Evangelista Torricelli, Galileo's young pupil and friend, decided to look at the problem from a different angle. Instead of focusing on the empty space inside the tube, he asked himself what else could be influencing the water. Because the only thing in contact with the water was the air surrounding the pool, he believed the pressure from this air could be the only thing preventing the water level in the tube from dropping further. He realized that the experiment was not only a tool to create a vacuum, but operated as a balance between the atmospheric pressure on the water outside the tube and the pressure from the water column inside the tube. The water level in the tube decreases until the two pressures are equal, which just happens to be when the water is at 10.3 meters. This idea was not easily accepted, as Galileo and others had traditionally thought that atmospheric air has no weight and exerts no pressure. Torricelli decided to repeat Berti's experiment with mercury instead of water. Because mercury was denser, it fell farther than the water, 
and the Mercury column stood only about 76 centimeters tall. Not only did this allow Torricelli to make the instrument much more compact, it supported his idea that weight was the deciding factor. A variation on the experiment used two tubes, with one having a large bubble at the top. If Galileo's interpretation had been correct, the bigger vacuum in the second tube should have exerted more suction and lifted the mercury higher. But the level in both tubes was the same. The ultimate support for Torricelli's theory came via Blaise Pascal, who had such a mercury tube taken up a mountain and showed that the mercury level dropped as the atmospheric pressure decreased with altitude. Mercury barometers based on Torricelli's original model remained one of the most common ways to measure atmospheric pressure until 2007, when restrictions on the use of mercury due to its toxicity led to them no longer being produced in Europe. Nevertheless, Torricelli's invention, born of the willingness to question long-accepted dogmas about vacuums and the weight of air, is an outstanding example of how thinking outside of the box or the tube can have a heavy impact. Alright, and also um, additional information about how um, a burden gauge, uh, gauge show or a burden gauge, uh, a burden pressure gauge is um, made now and it's a uh, principal of operation. So I'll be um, sharing you, I'll be sharing another video about that. Uh, Burden tube pressure gauge. Burden tube pressure gauges are used for the pressure measurement of rel. Alright, so may audio po ba? Last. Meron po. Start. Burden tube pressure gauge. Burden tube pressure gauges are used for the pressure measurement of relative pressure from 0.6 bar to 7,000 bars. They are classified as mechanical pressure measuring instruments and thus operate without any electric power. This video will cover the followings. 1. Working principle of burden tube pressure gauge. 2. Construction. 3. Working. 4. Advantages and disadvantages. If you are new to ADTW, click on the subscribe button below and turn on the notification to get all the updates from our channel. Working principle of burden tube pressure gauge. When an elastic transducer, such as burden tube in this case, is subjected to a pressure, it deflects. This deflection is proportional to the applied pressure when calibrated. Construction. A C-type burden tube consists of a long, thin walled cylinder of non-circular cross-section, which is sealed at one end. This tube is made from materials such as phosphor bronze, steel, and beryllium copper, and attached by a light mechanism which operates the pointer. The other end of the tube is fixed and is open for the application of the pressure, which is to be measured. The tube is soldered or welded to a socket at the base through which the fluid, whose pressure is to be measured, enters the C-type burden tube. Working of burden tube pressure gauge. As the fluid under pressure enters the burden tube, it tries to change the cross-section of the tube from oval to circular, and this tends to straighten out the tube. The tip of the burden tube is connected to a segmental liver through an adjustable link. The segmental liver end on the segment side is provided with a rack which meshes to a suitable pinion mounted on a spindle. The segmental liver is suitably pivoted and the spindle holds the pointer. The resulting movement of the free end of the tube causes the pointer to move over the scale. In real-life application, the pressure gauges are mounted with siphon tube. Siphon tube is a simple device used to protect a pressure sensor from high temperature media, such as steam. It can also be used to reduce the potentially damaging effects of rapid pressure changes. When first installed, the siphon should be filled with water or some other suitable separating medium. This medium continuously remains in contact with the burden tube. Burden tubes are generally made in three shapes. C-type, helical type, and spiral type. 
Advantages of burden. Two, the cost of burden tube pressure gauges is low. Three, burden tube are simple in construction. Four, they can be modified to give electrical outputs. Five, they are safe even for high pressure measurement. Six, accuracy is high, especially at high pressures. Disadvantages of burden tube pressure gauges. One, they respond slowly to changes in pressure. Two, they are subjected to hysteresis. Three, they are sensitive to shocks and vibrations. Four, amplification is a must, as the displacement of the free end of the burden tube is low. Five, it cannot be used for precision measurement. If you want more in-depth videos like this, then subscribe this channel and click on the bell icon to get notified. All right, so that's it for para sa pressure na. So, may questions ba yung iba? Group 2 to 4, do you have questions para sa group 1 regarding pressure? May question po ba? Dives? Wala naman. Alright, so if none, let us proceed sa next topic natin to be presented by still group 1. So, um, Utoy, um, Batayan, kindly um, share your screen na po. It's So Let's proceed to the temperature level measurement measuring instruments. Next slide po. So for us, what is temperature nga ba? So as we all know, the temperature is the hotness and the coldness of a body. It is, it is a method of measuring the amount of kinetic energy of the particles inside an object or in, or in other words, the internal energy of a system determined by, the, by its temperature. When particles move more quickly, the temperature increases and vice versa. So, temperature is the measure of how hot or cold something is that... That's the body temperature, the temperature of the water, air, and other liquids. So temperature can be measured with a thermo thermometer. The temperature of a substance is a measure of its hotness. When a substance is hot, temperature is high, and when its substance is less hot or cold, the temperature is lower. This is general knowledge when walking in the sun or rain, boiling or freezing or water or other things. Next is, uh, there are fun, fun temperature, temperature facts. Number one is the Earth's core is 9,392 Fahrenheit. Number two, two 212 Fahrenheit is the boiling point of water. Number three, the highest record temperature of Earth was in Zet Valley, California, where it reached 134 Fahrenheit in 1913. Next, and the last is 5 Fahrenheit is the melting point of ice cream. Next is slide po. So, let's proceed to the basic scales of the temperature. So, there are four ba basic scales of temperature. The Fahrenheit, Kelvin, Celsius, Celsius and Rankine. The Kelvin in in 1848, Lord Kelvin used define an absolute temperature scale based on the Carn cycle, which was later named after him. Absolute zero is called when the temperature becomes zero Kelvin, which is the lowest possible temperature. On this scale, water has freezing and boiling point of 207. 273.15 Kelvin and 373.15 Kelvin respectively. The temperature in Kelvin 
is represented with the degree Kelvin. Next is the degree Celsius. Celsius scale was invented in 1742 by Swedish, Swedish astronomer Anders, Anders Celsius. The freezing point, point of water in Celsius scale is zero degree, zero degree Celsius, while the boiling point is 100 degree Celsius. The temperature Celsius is represented with degree Celsius. Next is the degree Fahrenheit. The temperature scale was developed by Daniel Gabriel Fahrenheit in 1724. On this scale, water has a boiling point of 212 Fahrenheit, which I stated earlier and the fun facts of the temperature, and freezing point of 32 degree Fahrenheit. The temperature Fahrenheit is represented with degree Fahrenheit. And the last one is the degree Rankine. Rankine is an absolute unit of temperature invented in 1859 by a Scottish engineer and physicist, physicist William John Macomb Rankine. Similar on how Kelvin relates to Celsius scale, Rankine is related to Fahrenheit scaling. Both Rankine and Kelvin have zero values at absolute zero, but they are different at any values. The temperature Rankine is represented with degree Rankine. So, these are the four basic temperature scale in temperature. So, the next slide was introduced to you by Johns, which is the formula of the basic uh, temperature scales. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we will discuss the formulas of conversion for temperature. Now, let's start with the Celsius scale. If you want to convert um, degree Kelvin to degree Celsius, we simply subtract 273.8. Hold on, sorry. Anong name ng huling nag-report? Sorry. What's your name, Otay? Yung huling nag-report? Katibog po. Katibog. Alright, so thank you. Um, you may now... Um, you can continue na po, engineer parents. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Okay, again. In such a scale, if you want to convert um, degree Kelvin to degree Celsius, we simply subtract 273.15 to the given Kelvin temperature. For example, we want to convert 300 degrees Kelvin to degree Celsius. We simply subtract 273.15 to 300 degrees Kelvin in order to get the degree Celsius temperature, which is 26.85 degrees Celsius. And if we want to convert degree Celsius back to degree Kelvin, we simply add back the 273.15 to the given Kelvin temperature, uh, degree Celsius temperature. Always remember that 273.15 is a constant number while converting degree Celsius to Kelvin or Kelvin to degree Celsius. The same goes with the Fahrenheit scale. If we want to convert the degree Rankine to, the, to degrees Fahrenheit, we simply subtract 459.67 to the given Rankine temperature. And if we want to convert um, Fahrenheit to degree Rankine, we simply add back 459.67 to the degree Fahrenheit scale. Now in Rankine scale, it's different. If we want to convert Kelvin temperature to Rankine, we simply multiply 1.8 to the given Kelvin temperature. And if we want to convert um, degree Rankine to degree Kelvin, we simply sub, uh, divide the degree Rankine with 1.8 constant number. Next slide, please. Now let's talk about the, the instruments used to measure it, uh, temperature. First is a term couple, a type of temperature sensor that, that was made up of two different the two distinct metals that joined at one end. There are various types of thermocouples, but the most common type that you that are usually used is a K-type thermocouple that has a nickel-chromium metal 
that has a temperature range of negative 200 degrees Celsius up to 1,260 degrees Celsius. And then nickel aluminum uh, metal that has a 328 degrees Fahrenheit up to 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit range of temperature. When conjunction is heated or cooled, it induces change in electromotive force or EMF between the other ends. As the temperature rises, the output EMF of the thermocouples also goes up, but not but not linearly necessary. Not linearly necessary because we are um, thermocouples is using two different metals, and two different metals conduct heat differently. And if we apply temperature to different metals or materials there will be a change in resistance. And a change in resistance means there will also be a change in uh, voltage generated. Then the thermocouples will, uh, will record two different, um, two different voltage generated and, will, and the multimeter or voltmeter will record it. And as the, since we have two different uh, voltage recorded, the voltmeter or multimeter will measure the voltage difference, therefore telling us the temperature of the substance or material that we are measuring. Now, here's a short video on how we usually use a thermocouple. Okay, as you can see from the video, in order to use a thermocouple, we need a direct contact to the material or the substance in order for it to record the temperature the substance or the material has. There are certain types that uh, thermocouple use. Usually, some thermocouples are, are plugged in into a voltmeter or multimeter that, has already, that already has a temperature function. And that is all for thermocouples. Our next instrument for the temperature, for measuring temperature, is the RTD. Temperature is measured via a sensor called an RTD, which stands for Resistance Temperature Detector. It functions according to the basic concept that as a metal's temperature rises, so does its electrical resistance. The resistance elements in the sensor is used to measure the resistance of the current being passed through it when an electrical current is being carried through it. Electrical resistance rises along with the temperature of the resistance element. The applications of RTD. In automobiles, RTD sensors are utilized as intake air temperature sensors, oil level sensors, and engine temperature sensors. In instrumentation and communication for monitoring the temperature of transistor, gain stabilizers, amplifiers, etc. Power electronics, computer technology, consumer electronics, food handling and processing, industrial electronics, medical technology, aerospace, and the military all use the RTD. So here's a video to further explain the resistance temperature detector.
the simplest way to measure the resistance of an RTD is to inject a constant current into the RTD and to measure the voltage that develops across the RTD. For the next temperature measuring instrument is the infrared sensors. Infra infrared thermometers are efficient in measuring temperature across the range of clinical and industrial environments. It uses the idea of infrared radiation to determine the surface temperature without making direct physical contact with the object. The energy is transformed into an electrical signal by these photodetectors that is proportional to the infrared energy the object is emitting. The electrical signals offers the measurement of the temperature of the object that it is pointing at since the infrared energy that each object emits is proportional to its temperature. Through a window constructed of specialized plastic, the infrared impulses are sent into the sensor. Infrared wavelengths typically cannot penetrate through plastic but the sensors employ a transparent structure for those frequencies. In addition to shielding the sensors, electronics from debris, such as dust, dirt, and other external objects. This material filters out undesired frequencies. So here's another video to explain infrared thermometers. Taking a temperature sample, lightly depress the trigger, holding the gun in a stable position three to five centimeters away from the candidate's head. An accurate sample will give you a green reading. When the sample taken is incorrect, it'll indicate low. For demonstration purposes, we have the candidate hold a hot pack up against her head. When a sample is taken and the temperature indicates a fever over 38 degrees, the gun will flash red. Our next instrument. Activate. Turning for. Turning for. Good morning, po. Ang atin na pong next instrument po is the biometallic device. A biometallic device or thermometer is one of the temperature measurement device that converts the media's temperature into mechanical displacement using a bimetallic strip. It consists of two different metals such as steel and copper, but strip and bars can be also be used since these metals have different coefficient of thermal expansion. So yun pong nakikita po natin na strip sa gitna po ng ating bimetallic device is consists of steel and brass na siya pong sumasagap or nagsasensor ng ating mga temperature sa bagay or appliances. Kalimitan po is sa mga appliances. So as the temperature rises, the strip will turn in the direction of metal with the lower temperature coefficient. When the temperature decreases, the strip bends in the direction of metal having a higher temperature coefficient. The way na yung metal po natin is nakakasagap po ng higher temperature, abang tumatas po yung temperature, nag-expand po yung ating strip coils or yung metal uh, at bumubuo ng pag-ikot or pag po ng ating strip coils. Then kapag naman po bumababa po yung temperature, yung ating pong strip coils is bumabalik or paloob na uli yung pag-ikot niya. So bali po yung ating strip strip coils is doon po nakabase yung pagkuha ng ating mga temperature. Ito. By metallic thermometers are used in residential devices like air conditioners, ovens, and industrial devices like heaters, hot wires, refineries, and etc. Since they are a simple, durable, and cost-efficient way in measuring temperature. So kalimitan nga daw pong ginagamit po itong ating biometallic device 
um, sa mga device, sa mga appliances like electric kettle po. Ito po ay nagsisilbing safety components na kapag sobra na po yung init or kumukulo na po yung ating electric kettle is nagsasat down na po ito. Next po. So bali po, para po mas lalo po nating maintindihan kung ano po yung may metallic device po, eh, ito po yung video. In this video, we will deal with the design and operation of a bimetallic strip thermometer. So let's get started. The simplest design of a bimetal thermometer is to wrap the bimetallic strip into a spiral. The inner end of the spiral is firmly connected to the housing. A pointer is attached to the outer end of the spiral. The measured temperature can then be read off a calibrated scale. Such a design using a bimetallic spiral is not only very space-saving, but also cost-effective. However, the disadvantage is that the display and the temperature sensor are not separated from each other. The entire bimetal thermometer must therefore be located directly in the medium whose temperature is to be measured. Such thermometers are used, for example, in refrigerators or freezers, or to determine the room temperature. In many cases it is necessary to separate the pointer from the bimetallic coil. For example, if the water temperature is to be measured in a heating pipe, as is usual in heating systems, the temperature sensor must then be located inside the pipe, while the display for the temperature must be outside. Or in the food industry it is also necessary to separate the display from the sensor if, for example, the temperature inside the food has to be measured. In these cases, bimetal thermometers are equipped with a bimetal strip wrapped into a helical coil. The helical bimetal is firmly connected at one end to the inside of a measuring tube. The bimetal is attached to a cylindrical pin, which is pressed firmly into the stem. A rotatable metal rod is guided through this helical coil, which is connected to it at the loose end. A pointer is attached to the upper end of the metal rod. If the measuring tube is now heated, the helical bimetal winds up and rotates the metal rod. On a calibrated scale the corresponding temperature can be read off. Such bimetal thermometers can also be equipped with switch contacts which close an electrical circuit when a certain temperature is exceeded or undershot, an electrical signal is triggered accordingly. Switch contacts can thus perform control tasks, for example as a thermostat for underfloor heating systems, which switches off the heating pump for safety reasons when temperatures are too high and switches it on again when the temperature falls below a certain level. So yun nga po, uh, kapag nga po nakakaramdam po ng init yung atin pong may metallic device, is nakita naman po natin na nagro-rotate po ito and tumatas po yung ating gauge. Next po. And ang isa pa po, po nating instrument is a uh, change of state temperature sensors. A change of state temperature sensor measures a change in the state of a material caused by a change in temperature, such as the transition from ice to water and then to steam. This type of device is commercially available in the form of labels, pellets, crayons, or lockers. For example, it can be used on the steam traps. So yun po nga, ang example po dito is yung steam traps. Kapag po yung steam traps po ay nag exceed na po sa certain point, makikita po natin itong ating device po na naka-white dot. So magiging black dot po ito kapag ka po nag-umabot na po sa certain point yung ating steam traps. Then ang isa ko po po example dito sa ating temperature sensor is kung familiar po tayo sa temperature gauge po ng mga sasakyan. So alam naman po natin na yung temperature gauge po na sasakyan is connected po sa radiator. And yung radiator po is naglalaman po siya ng coolant or water. Kapag po uh, wala na pong nasasagap na uh, coolant or water yung atin pong temperature gauge, dun pa lang po nag nangyayari yung pag-overheat po na sasakyan. So malaking tulong po yung temperature gauge sa mga sasakyan. Next na po. So good afternoon po. Ang next device po natin is yung silicon diode sensor. A silicon diode sensor is a device that has been developed specially for cryogenic temperature range. So kung di po, kung di po tayo familiar sa cryogenic temperature range, ang cryogenic temperature range po ay nade-define from negative 150 degrees Celsius to absolute zero po. So essentially, they are linear devices where the conductivity of the diode increased linearly in low cryogenic region. A silicon diode, diode is used 
as the sensing element of silicon diode sensor, a type of electrical component which may be used to detect changes in temperature, light, or other physical situation. So, madalas po natin siyang makikita sa mga ice plant since ito po ay na, nakaka-measure ng cryogenic range temperature po. So, para mas maintindihan po natin, may provided po kaming video. Force, internal force of current source and LCD. I have also collected a LCD to show the calculated temperature values I'm getting from this diode, which is connected between current and the output of constant current source and the input of the ADC. Instead of doing the whole calibration process, I guess the room temperature and I'm using the minus 2 millivolt per 1 Celsius degree to calculate the temperature to change from the first ADC reading, which was done when the diode was at the room temperature. These non-calibrated values are quite good, but doing the simple calibration would make them even better. Okay, so dito po, mas madali natin mas ma mababasa kung ano yung temperature ng isang bagay kasi meron siyang maliit na LCD na accurate yung ibinibigay niyang temperature. So for the next device po. So lahat naman po tayo is familiar na dito sa next device and this is the thermometer po. This is any object that with at least one measurable property that changes as the temperature changes. So, ito yung thermometer. It consists of glass capillary tube connected with a bulb filled with liquid uh, thermometric sub substance and was sealed to the other end. When the temperature increases, the liquid will expand in volume and rises the capillary based on how hot the measured property was. So, bata pa lang po tayo, familiar na tayo dito sa pang-measure na to kasi ito yung ginagamit natin dati nung may mga sakit pag may lagna tayo kasi ito yung pinakamabilis na maka-measure ng temperature and sa ganito pong design ng thermometer hindi na hindi na siya masyadong nakikita ngayon kasi yung substance po sa loob niya is delikado which is yung mercury po kaya ngayon po ang nakikita lang natin ay yung mga electric na ano na lang po thermometer yun lang po thank you All right, thank you so much, Group One. So temperature, naman, is very basic na sa inyong lahat, no? So kahit hindi na natin to um, naliman yung discussion. Um, dun sa ibang grupo, um, sa sa Group One, may questions po ba kayo, guys? Wala naman. Uh, wala naman. So let us ano lang summarize lang yung discuss ng Group One, no? About kay temperature, no? So let uh, me. Um, present another video no? share another video ano po? mas maintindahan natin yung concept ng temperature Earthbend Hello learners, this is Earthpen. Hello, learners. This is Earth Pen. Today, we are going to. Hello, learners. This is Earth Pen. Today, we are going to talk about another fun topic in physics. It is all about temperature and thermometers. But before we begin the discussion, if you would like to encourage us to produce more educational content, please show your support by giving a like to the video and subscribing to our channel. You can also help our team grow with your monetary support through our donation PayPal link located in the description below.
So, what is temperature? Temperature is a measure of how fast the atoms and molecules that make up a substance are moving. This means that the faster the atoms move, the higher the temperature is. So, how do we read temperature? Or how do we know what is the temperature of a certain object? We can know the temperature of an object through the reading in a thermometer. So what is a thermometer? A thermometer is an instrument for measuring and indicating temperature. Thermometers present nowadays. There are six kinds of thermometer based on how they work. We have manometric, liquid in glass, gas thermometers, bimetallic thermometers, digital thermometers, and infrared thermometers. Let's discuss them one by one. A manometric thermometer determines the temperature based on the change of pressure in a gas or liquid. This type is also known as pressure field or vapor pressure thermometer. Next is the liquid in glass thermometer. It is the oldest type of thermometer it is actually used in almost anywhere since it is very simple to use. The liquid inside this type of thermometer can either be mercury or alcohol. Next is the gas thermometer. It determines the temperature based on the difference in pressure or volume of the gas it is filled with. Most of the gas thermometers use hydrogen as gas. Bimetallic thermometers. They are perfect for higher temperatures as they become less sensitive and accurate at lower temperature. They can be found in many household appliances like stoves. A digital thermometer. It has a thermistor that reacts to the change in temperature and projects the result on the device's screen. And the last kind of thermometer is the infrared thermometer. An infrared thermometer uses thermal radiation that objects emit to measure thermometer. Now let's have a fan fact. Before we proceed, did you know that 57.8 degrees Celsius or 136 degrees Fahrenheit is the hottest temperature ever recorded on Earth? It was recorded on September 13, 1922 in Al Zizaya, located in Libya, and the coldest temperature ever recorded on Earth is negative 89.2 degrees Celsius or negative 128.6 degrees Fahrenheit. It was recorded at Vostok Station located in Antarctica on July 21, 1983. Amazing, right? Now, going back to our topic, temperature is measured in many different scales, including Fahrenheit, Celsius, and Kelvin. Let us tackle them one by one. Celsius, also known as centigrade, was developed by under Celsius in 1742. It is a measure of temperature that is abbreviated by C. Fahrenheit was developed by Gabriel Daniel Fahrenheit in 1714. It is a measure of temperature that is abbreviated with F. Kelvin. This was designed by Lord Kelvin William Thomson. It is a measure of temperature that is abbreviated with the letter K. Moreover, Kelvin is a temperature scale designed so that zero Kelvin is defined as absolute zero, and the size of one unit is the same as the size of one degrees Celsius. The conversion formula for temperature is as follows. Temperature expressed by the Fahrenheit scale can be converted to the Celsius scale equivalent using the equation Degrees Celsius is equal to degrees Fahrenheit minus 32 degrees all over 1.8. Similarly, temperature expressed by the Celsius scale can be converted to the Fahrenheit scale equivalent using the equation degrees Fahrenheit is equal to 1.8 times degrees Celsius plus 32 degrees. Note that a degree Celsius is 1.8 times bigger than 1 degree Fahrenheit. Conversions between Celsius temperature and Kelvin temperature can be performed using the equation Kelvin is equal to degree Celsius plus 273.15. Before we end the video, let us first summarize everything. Today, you learned about temperature, thermometers, type of thermometers, and temperature scales. So, did you enjoy our topic for today? 
I hope you certainly did. See you again next time for more interesting and fun topics only here in Earth. All right, so that's about um, it. Para po sa temperature. So, do you have questions po ba? Plus, qu questions, clarifications? Plus? Wala naman po, sir. Wala naman. Alright. So, um, once again po, um, thank you for, para po, thank you sa group 1 para sa um, wonderful presentation of our first two topic, which is uh, pressure and um, temperature. So, everyone, let's give them a round of applause. Um, give them a clap, please. All right, thank you. All right. So, um, since tapos na natin si pressure and temperature, na, sinasunod lang natin yung ating timeline sa syllabus. So, by next week, during our face-to-face -face class next week, we will be conducting your first laboratory. Na, so, yung name po ng ating laboratory na ikakandak by next week is yung Calibra calibration of pressure cages. If, um, if meron man po akong ipadalang materials or equipment, so i-update ko na lang kayo siguro by Friday or Saturday. No. So, um, what else? So, um, lahat naman po is nakapag-report. No? So, lahat naman ng um, group 1 is na bigyan ko ng grade. So, um, yep. So, after, lang, um, after next week, no, after uh, by next week na magkakandak tayo ng laboratory then the following week yung laboratory reports nyo is i-present nyo sa full class then after nung presentation ng laboratory report nyo resume tayo ng discussion para sa ating mga susunod na topics so um, yung mga susunod natin natin topics is carried by group 2 I think na group 2 um, if, um, your topic is what's your topic group 2? Way, speed, flow speed right? tama ba? Tama po ba, class? Yes po, sir. Alright. So, paki-prepare na lang po ako ng presentation na. So, if, um, last uh, call, do you have questions, clarifications po regarding sa topic today? Guys? Nine, sir. Alright. So, if not, I think that's it for me today. Now, once again, thank you so much, Group 1, for uh, your presentation. If wala na pong question, um, or if may questions man kayo, so you can just send, um, Send me a message po sa aking uh, Facebook, no? And you could also send this sa ating group chat messenger and through my email na na, na um, ibigay ko naman sa inyo dun sa syllabus, no? So, if, again, with wala ng question, thank you all for attending this class. Bye for now and I'll see you all guys next meeting. Alright, so conduct... Thank you, you po, sir. Thank you, po. Thank you po, sir. Thank you po, sir. Thank you po, sir. Thank you po, sir. Yeah.